This video is sponsored by Keysight Technologies. I've wanted to do a space shot for a little while now. A space shot is a rocket that goes above 100 kilometers. I've got plans slowly churning for this. It certainly won't happen this year. It probably won't happen next year, and it might happen the year after. Either way, it's a long way off. This massive nose cone in the background should give you a little bit of a sense of scale of this space shot vehicle. It is a six inch diameter, two-stage vehicle that's like 20 plus feet tall. Because it's that large and will be very expensive, we want to incrementally test the subsystems on a smaller vehicle. Testing incrementally at the small scale makes a lot more sense than firing a ton of these eight foot long, six inch diameter Q motors that we're going to need. So that's why I built Avalanche here. Avalanche is a test bed rocket. The goals here are to gather more data for AVA, the flight computer that I've built, test new components like telemetry, power, new cameras, and get flight experience. I've flown a few high-powered rockets before, and each one has taught me tons of lessons, so the more lessons we can learn at the small scale, the better. I already have a bunch of 38mm motor cases that I used for thrusty McThrust face, so I decided to build the rocket around those. Starting with the fins, I used quarter-inch fiberglass that was left over from Lumineer. These are too heavy for what we actually actually need to do, but I want this vehicle built like a tank. We aren't going for altitude or speed here, we're going for a rocket that you kinda can't destroy. I cut out the fins using stencils that I made, and then I chamfered the edges on a belt sander. For the motor tube, I used a spare 38mm cardboard tube and attached the fins using a 3D printed jig. I added two quarter 20 bolts at the bottom for motor retention, and I lathered the whole thing in 9340 Loctite. I then made massive, messy internal fillets and basically coated the whole tube in epoxy. Even for what these fins needed to be, this was very overkill. The forward centering ring got an eye bolt attached to it and got lathered in epoxy as well, and for the body tube I used some spare 3 inch fiberglass. I carefully sketched out where the slots for the fins would need to go using a ruler and a little bit of luck, and I cut these slots using a Dremel. These don't need to be perfect because we'll end up filling them with epoxy, and my goodness, the strength from the base fillets means the fillets on these outer tubes is just, they're not that important. Before epoxying the fins in place, I attached the aft rail button, which I am pretty sure I almost forgot to do. Uh, it would have been fine, you could have made it work, but I almost forgot to do it. I bond prepped the outside of the fiberglass tube and the fins, mostly using sandpaper and a little acetone here. The fillets here are nothing that I'm super proud of, uh, even an ounce of effort could have made them prettier, but the goal here is just to keep the fins from falling off and these will do the job fine enough. Once the epoxy had cured, I headed outside to spray paint. I started with a base of white semi-gloss, and then I added blue accents on the fins. Same as always for this stuff. I used a lot of painter's tape to lay down where I wanted and didn't want paint, then I covered the rest of the rocket in paper to protect it and hit it with a coat of blue semi-gloss. This technique works fantastic for most of my high-powered rockets, and the results are usually great. For the logo on this rocket, I printed out the font on two pages, lined them up, and then cut it out to use it as a stencil. This is the same approach that I used on Send It, and for single-use stencils, it works well enough. I then used Super 77 spray adhesive to stick it to the rocket, I covered up the other areas, and I hit it with blue semi-gloss paint. Same thing as the blue tape method here. It works well if you've got some patience, and usually the mistakes aren't too bad if you look at it from like five feet away. All right, now the goal here with Avalanche, or Avalanche if you want to call it that, is to test AVA. AVA gets mounted to this little 3D printed housing that I made. The housing has space for a beefy two cell LiPo on the back, and on the bottom I mounted an Altus Metrum Easy Mini, which is a commercial dual deploy computer. Since we're testing a lot of experimental code on AVA for these flights, I didn't want to put AVA in primary control of the parachutes, so that's why we have the third-party computer on there. Now the current draw on this little board is basically nothing, so the battery for it is this itty-bitty little one-cell 100 milliamp hour LiPo. For the upper section of the rocket, I swapped things out quite a bit between the different flights of Avalanche. So I started out with cardboard tubes because I had spares, and they're much easier to modify than fiberglass. Speaking of modifications, one of the first things I wanted to test with Avalanche is flying this fancy new GoPro that I got. This is the GoPro Hero 10 Bone. Part of my goal with the space shot coming up in a few years is that I want to capture some of the most gorgeous footage from space, and so focusing on camera development on the ground at the small scale is what we're doing here. This GoPro here shoots 4K footage at 120 frames per second, so it is definitely on the list of cameras that I would like to potentially fly. Anyway, I secured it to the rocket by draining the world's supply of hot glue. For testing here, I'm also using a new telemetry radio. For a long time, I have been using these XB Pro S3B radios. They work pretty well, but they aren't very powerful. 
The radio that I'm now using on Avalanche and a lot of the stuff going forward is an RFD 900 radio, which can go up to one watt. Those little XBs only go to 250 milliwatts, so this is basically like four times the transmission power. With all of these things covered, I charged up batteries and headed out to the Friends of Amateur Rocketry test site in Mojave. And while I'm making that trip, I'd like to talk to you about the sponsor for today's video, Keysight Technologies. Keysight makes all sorts of incredible tools that you can use to help build and analyze your projects. From radio testers and multimeters to pulse generators and oscilloscopes, Keysight has you covered. And if you want to learn more about them, you are in luck. Keysight World Innovate is their annual vision conference. It's coming up and it will be held virtually so anyone can attend for free. The conference begins on October 4th for the Americas and October 11th for Europe and will feature keynotes from tech leaders like the director of product design at Tesla, multiple quantum physicists, computing experts, and more. Each day focuses on a central theme and if you're curious to learn more about things like AI, quantum computing, electric vehicles, this is the conference for you. If you want to attend, you should sign up for free using the link in the description down below. And if you use that link in the description down below, Keysight said they would send a mug and a shirt like this to a few of the folks who do. And so one more time, if you want to sign up for free, you can do that using the link in the description down below. Thank you so much to Keysight Technologies for sponsoring today's video. And now let's head out to the desert and launch this rocket. Four, three, two, one. A little wiggly. This first flight flew on a Cesaroni I-297 rocket motor to about 770 meters. The wiggle on the way up looks like I played stability just a little bit too close in open rocket. The simulation looked pretty good, but it's difficult to model the nonsense of having that GoPro stick out at the top, and I think that's probably what did it. I also unwillingly made a nose cone donation to the desert by using a little bit too much black powder for motor ejection. The nose cone was filled with a little bit of lead to improve stability and was attached to a bunch of fairly flimsy cardboard tubes, and at ejection, it just ripped through the cardboard. So that nose cone is a, it's a donation now. In terms of things that I wanted to test here, the telemetry through the flight looked very strong, although I don't have a good recording of the screen during it. And the footage that came from that onboard camera is just, it's chef's kiss, it's beautiful. The mounting for the camera is certainly not ideal, and we'll need to try something different going forward, but that is what Avalanche is all about. Okay, so for the next flight, my friend Andrew Adams was coming to town and was already building a similar sized vehicle to Avalanche, or Avalanche, I don't know what to call it. About a week before he arrived, we got the bright idea that we could turn our two rockets into one vehicle as two stages. The goal was to have his upper stage firing on a CTI J94, which is a pretty low thrust but long burn motor, and Avalanche would be flying as the booster flying on a CTI I-297, which is the same motor that we flew for the first flight. I built this little staging mechanism to yeet the upper stage off, and it did not really work, uh, but it was made of a piston and some 3D printed parts. I also placed a camera inside there to capture the upper stage separation event. The adapter between the vehicles was made out of these four fiberglass sections of tube that sort of clamped onto the upper stage, and they were all held in place using a tremendous amount of rocket epoxy. We added fin extensions on the booster to improve stability off the pad, and in case a reminder is needed, the goal here isn't to build something that's pretty, or that I'm super proud of, or that I think was a very good idea. Uh, the goal was to build something that worked, and the fin extensions worked. They improved the stability. Finally, I also drew up a new ground control interface in processing. A few things that I've learned through flying lots of rockets in the desert. You want an interface that has a white background and black text that's a lot easier to see on a dim laptop screen in the sun. You also don't care about almost all of your telemetry when the rocket is flying. There's stuff that you care about on the pad, like continuity and the state of your vehicle, but when it's flying, you kinda wanna know just a few things. Altitude, speed, and GPS latitude and longitude. That's almost all that you need when the rocket is in the air. So the goal with this new ground station is to keep it dead simple, and the numbers that you wanna look at, they're really big. With that all covered, we got the vehicle out to the launch pad and sent it. Come on, come on, come on! Come on. Whoa, 
We got shoots on the booster! <laughs> the flight looked gorgeous from the ground with a successful ignition on both stages, and the separation mechanism wasn't quite strong enough. As a result of that, we accidentally hot staged, so that little camera inside the interstage it, uh, it, didn't, it didn't make it. This was a super fun flight though. I have never done a two-stage flight before and there's some interesting ignition logic stuff that had to happen on Ava to determine if it's safe to light that upper stage. I don't think I'd fly a rocket in this way again, which is to say I wouldn't fly a two-stage vehicle uh, like deciding to fly it a week before the flight, but I did learn a lot. Also, if you're interested, Andrew is a fantastic rocket engineer himself, and if you wanna check out his YouTube channel, it's down in the description. Okay, so for the last flight here, I focused a lot more on the code and a lot less on the external stuff. I restructured a whole lot about how Ava's Kalman filter works, and if you don't know what that is, the Kalman filter takes data from the barometer, the accelerometers, and the GPS, and it fuses them all to come up with the ideal estimate of where our vehicle is. All of those sensors have some amount of noise to them, and so we can trust all of them if we define how much noise they each have and how much certainty we have in them, and that's the job of the Kalman filter. Um, maybe understandably, it's kind of a complex thing to come up with how sensitive each sensor should be. So tuning a Kalman filter is one of the points of Avalanche here. For this third flight, I also wanted to develop a new way of shooting onboard video from these rockets. If you've seen any HPR flight with onboard video, any of the past flights in this video, you'll know the rocket spins up a whole bunch. And the spin is kind of a function of the speed because you're never going to get your fins perfectly aligned. You're always gonna have some amount of roll torque. So how do you get good video that doesn't spin on the way up? Well, you could add control surfaces, right? You could add some type of control system that resists the roll on the vehicle. But because Avalanche is a test bed that's ultimately working toward a space shot, we need to be thinking about what it takes to get to space. And on a two-stage vehicle, like we're developing for this space shot, the second stage really benefits from being spin stabilized. You want that thing just balling up as it goes. Stability in the atmosphere is tricky already, and when you're doing like a Mach 4 or Mach 5, it gets a little bit harder. That's why we need spin stabilization. So how do we get good video with a spinning rocket? Well, what if you just unspin the camera? I printed this little housing that rides on bearings around a 3 8 inch threaded rod that connects the sections above and below the camera. The whole assembly can spin using a brushless motor, and I'm using one of the Spark PCBs with an IMU to control the rotation of this spinning camera mount. I got all of this stuff together before I realized that the motor I had selected for this device was far too strong. <laughs> Uh-oh. I am in trouble. Okay. That's a lot faster than I wanted it to be. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Rut row. Anyway, the point here is that they make motors which are good for propellers, which is what I used here, and they make motors that are good for, like, camera gimbals, which rotate really slowly and with a lot more precision. I bought the wrong motor, and we're gonna fix that in the future. Anyway, I realized this discrepancy a little bit too late in the launch preparation process, and there's value to flying this vehicle with or without the spinny camera thing. We can always fly it again with the spinny camera thing, so I flew it with the motor turned off. The flight here looked great on a CTI I-175 rocket motor, albeit just a little bit slow. The reason for this is that the camera setup in its current design is pretty heavy, and we've got some lead weight in the nose cone for stability. Before I sign off here, I wanted to take a look at the flight data, since one of the goals of this flight was to tune the Kalman filter. What you're seeing here in the red line is the acceleration on the vehicle from the rocket motor, and on the green line is the barometric altitude. Now, you'll see these two spikes up here, and that's because of the ejection charge. Our pressure changes inside of the vehicle, and so our effective barometric altitude changes. This is a lot of what I was talking about with the noise of the different sensors involved in the common filter. Additionally, we have our GPS altitude, or at least GPS relative altitude. This is a slower updating variable and a slower logged variable 
variable and is generally less reliable than the barometer. That said, it can go higher than the barometer. Our barometer caps out at about 20 or 30,000 meters, and the GPS can go just a little bit higher than that. But neither of these are excellent representations of where the vehicle actually is. We want something that is a little bit in between both of these. That's the job of the Kalman filter. And unfortunately for flight three, the Kalman filter doesn't look great. Um, it's pretty close to what we would want here. This blue line is the filtered result. Uh, and because of a bug in the timing of the filter, uh, we have a pretty slow slope on the ascent and we don't quite pick it up uh, and recover from our errors here with the measurements. Uh, after Apogee, we start uh, distrusting basically or having a lack of trust of our acceleration measurements and this results in a really weird spiky measurement of our common filter on the way down until the two measurement estimates or just measurements converge. Um, but basically, all of this is to say there's a lot of work to be done here with the common filter, and I am actively working on it. So uh, next time we fly Avalanche or next time we do a flight with some common filter updates, I hope to update you with some cleaner looking results. Anyway, that pretty much brings us up to speed on Avalanche and what its goals are. It's actually already accomplishing those goals. I'm learning a whole lot, I'm thinking harder about how we're going to design the space shot, and I'm having a lot of fun. I'm also really excited for this like camera spinny device. It's gonna be hard to get it to work perfectly, but I think once it's tuned really well, we should be able to get gorgeous video. Until then, thank you to Keysight Technologies for sponsoring today's video. Thanks to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.